So we're kind of going to switch uh, at the style and I guess the tempo as well and travel a new road for me, moderating um, a session where, this, where the presentation style is called Pecha Kucha. Um, if you haven't heard about it, you're probably not alone. I had to Wikipedia it. Um, but basically, um, our next speakers are set with the challenge of uh, being limited to 20 slides. Um, ideally with minimal uh, words, and each slide transitions automatically every 20 seconds. So um, go for it first. I'm going to um, introduce Dr. Jacqueline Scheisser, um, whose presentation title is Stem Cell Derived Beta Cells, The State of Play. Um, Dr. Scheisser is a senior research officer at the Murdoch Children's Hospital, uh, Murdoch Children's Research Institute, sorry, and her current research focuses on the utilisation of stem cell models of type 1 diabetes. Welcome, Jackie. All right, well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk today. Um, I'm going to be just talking about some of our laboratories work in using stem cell-derived beta cells for both beta cell replacement therapies and T1D modelling in a dish. Um, I'm hoping that this is just going to play. Or oh, do I have to press the button? Oh, there we go. Okay, so um, just a bit of a bit of information in the way of introduction on stem cells. So stem cells come in two different flavors, so to speak. So uh, either embryonic stem cells, um, which are shown here, which are derived from the inner cell mass of the pre-implantation uh, blastocyst. Um, these were originally derived back in the late 1990s. Um, and more recently, people have transitioned to using uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, for which Shinya Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize. So these are using any sort of somatic adult cell to which we can add a cocktail of reprogramming genes or chemicals and derive an IPS cell, which looks very much like an ES cell. So both of these cells are sorts of pluripotent stem cells. They're both very similar in some ways. And importantly, they both have the capacity to form derivatives of all three germ layers. So this might be blood cells, liver cells, heart cells, or in the case of things that we're interested in, we're interested in deriving pancreatic endocrine cells and some immune cell work that I'll describe later on in this talk. So, like I've mentioned, um, as a laboratory, we're interested in two main uses for stem cell-derived um, beta cells and also immune cells. So we're interested, as a lot of people in the field are, in beta cell replacement therapies. So this would be using an avatar of beta cells, which are derived from PSCs to replace beta cells in the T1D islet. So this is the uh, general scheme here. So in a normal islet, as you uh, develop diabetes, you lose the beta cells within it. And then we could use pluripotent stem cells to create an avatar. They're not quite like a beta cell. They're pretty close. They're a little bit different, but we can add these back into the islet to hopefully restore normal function in the diabetic setting. So like most groups, um, we use developmental principles to recapitulate um, what happens during normal embryogenesis to turn our stem cells into beta cells. So without going into this slide, there is a whole series of steps that occur during embryogenesis, and we add various chemicals and growth factors to recapitulate these happening in a dish. To facilitate this, our lab has uh, generated a dual tagged reporter line, which I'll show some data from today. But in this, insulin expression is marked by GFP expression. Cells that express glucagon are marked by M-cherry expression. So you can see here on eMERGE, this facilitates the identification of these cells by immunofluorescence as well as flow cytometry. So just to go tiny, tiny bit of protocols, um, the first stage of development is to form the definitive endoderm. This here is just showing a flow cytometric plot of a differentiation, showing that cells transit through a stage where they co-express markers such as EPCAM and CD184, which is CXCR4. They also express this other range of markers. The cells then go on to form the pancreatic endoderm, which is marked by the expression of PDX1. So if you look here, you can see that the nuclei in this image express PDX1 and the cells express beta-catenin. These cells also express other markers such as GATA4, GATA6. And as they continue to differentiate into the endocrine cell lineage, they'll transit through a variety of other stages, but just to show the endpoint here, where you end up with a variety of endocrine cells which express either insulin, which is marked here by the expression of GFP, or they'll express glucagon, which is marked by the expression of M-cherry. And you'll notice that there's other cell types in this cluster of cells that don't express either. Some of these express other pancreatic hormones, some of them are other things entirely. So apart from beta cell replacement, we're also interested in using these iPSCs to model type 1 diabetes in a dish. 
type 1 diabetes is not just about making endocrine cells, you also need to make a very large variety of immune cells. So collectively as a lab, we've been working on this over a number of years, and I'm just going to show a little bit of data on some different immune cell lineages. So to do this in a type 1 diabetic model, you need type 1 diabetic lines. Um, as part of a grant co-held with Stuart Mannering, the lab derived a large, a large number of T1D derived IPSC lines from six different donors, at least six different clones per donor. So lots and lots of lines. Um, and what the plan with, with this is basically we had these T1D donors, the IPSCs were made from these. So as I've just shown, you can derive insulin positive cells. And what I'm going to show you now is that you can derive other blood cell types. And then you can create a model in a dish to try and observe interactions between the immune cells and the beta cells to understand kind of causative factors in type 1 diabetes. So first cell type I'm going to show you, this was published a few years ago. Um, but this is the generation of um, macrophages. So this goes through a protocol that once again follows developmental principles. Uh, the cells produced here express CD14, CD16, CD86, HLA class 2. They look like a macrophage. Do they act like a macrophage? They do act like a macrophage. So they are able to present peptide as an antigen pre in an antigen presenting cell, which is able to be blocked by the expression of um, the addition of anti-DR antibodies. And this here is just showing T cell activation as marked by CD69. So apart from macrophages, we also need to be adding other, other blood cell types. So as a lab, uh, people have been working towards making different B cell types. So B cells here are marked by the expression of uh, CD19 and CD10. Um, they also express the, the RAG recombinase gene, which is essential for um, the B cell receptor rearrangement. Um, and we've also been able to make uh, T lymphocyte cells. So these cells um, express CD7. They lack expression of CD161. And we get a variety of types with both CD4, tiny bit of CD8, and a lot of double positive cells. And we currently have a number of projects in the lab working at maturing these different T cell types into particularly uh, interested in making T regs. Um, the final cell type I'm going to show a little bit of data on. This will hopefully come out for publication in the next couple of weeks is um, making some NK cells. So these cells co-express CD7 and CD61. They lack expression of this RAG recombinase, and they express CD56. I'm not showing any functional data, but these cells do have some function in vitro. So the current work in the lab is to basically combine all these different cell types, and then we can start factoring in things like Coxsackie virus or different enteroviruses or different other factors that you might want to look at and look to see if we can actually try and understand some of the processes that happen behind type 1 diabetes. All right, so in summary, as a lab, we're kind of interested in using PSCs uh, in two different ways. So we're interested in both beta cell replacement, uh, particularly in optimizing endocrine cell generation cell protocols, um, as well as using both the beta cells derived from PSCs as well as various immune cell types as a disease model to, stu to study cellular interactions that occur during type 1 diabetes. So thank you to everyone that contributed. Um, and thank you again for the opportunity to speak today. And thank you very much, Jackie. Um, so next, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Peter Thorne, um, who's a professor at the University of Sydney and chair of molecular and cellular physiology, running his own research group, the Thorne Lab. Thorn Lab uses cutting-edge microscopy, transgenic and molecular approaches to understand how insulin secretion is regulated in health and disease. And Professor Thorne is going to talk to us about how to improve beta cell function within an implant. Thank you. Okay, so this is a first for me if I've got to keep up with my slides. Um, so yeah, so my name is Peter Thorne. I work uh, down the road in the Charles Perkins Centre, which is only a few kilometres from here in the University of Sydney. And today I'm going to be talking about how to improve uh, beta cell function uh, within an implant. This is the bit where you have to wait for the slide. <laughs> Could be a long way. Here we go, right. So like many people, we've been captivated by data like this, which is showing you uh, the effect of islet transplantation. And this is somebody who has very poor glucose control, as you can see on the left-hand side. But after the transplant, then actually the glucose control is very good and almost normal. So this is very promising in terms of cell-based uh, treatments. And of course, we're looking on the horizon to stem cells, and we just heard from a talk there. Uh, the stem cells it, uh, could provide an infinite so source of beta cells. And at the moment, they have many of the characteristics of beta cells. They secrete insulin in response to glucose. 
but they don't respond to normal glucose levels and they don't secrete su sufficient in, uh, insulin to be actually a treatment as such. Now the template that's driving stem cell research at the moment is very much looking at the single beta cell and this is a, a cartoon representation of stimulus secretion coupling within a beta cell showing you glucose entry, closure of potassium channels, the opening of calcium channels and the entry of calcium and then the triggering of insulin secretion. However, when you look at a beta cell, that's only one part of the story, and we know that they are strongly influenced by the environment, just like we are. So if they're in a poor environment, like we would be on the left-hand side, then we're not very happy, but you provide us with the right stimulus, the right environment, then like on the right-hand side, we can be happy. And so that's really what we're looking at in the lab to try and understand how the environment is influencing uh, beta cell behavior. Now, the thesis in our lab is that it's not just sufficient to identify what might be influencing uh, the islet and then putting it in a blender and then crossing your fingers and hoping for the best. What you need to be able to understand is how that environment is presented to the beta cells and then how the beta cells actually respond to that environment. So this is a summary of the presentation I'm going to give today and what we know is that when we're looking at beta cells, almost all the beta cells within an islet will make contact with the capillaries and we know that capillary contact is very important and as I'm highlighting here it's a region where you get targeting of uh, exercise doses of insulin granules, and it's also a region where you have enrichment of calcium channel activity. So the primary method that we use in the lab is the slice technique. So we've got a live pancreas on the left-hand side. We inject it with low melt melting point agarose, section it on a vibratome, and then you can see on the right-hand side that within those sections, you can clearly identify individual islets. Now, the importance of using this technique is that it preserves the structure of the islet. And what you can see here is just a, a, a record of one of the slices where mostly what you can see is exocrine tissue, so that's what you can see in the red. But you can see that there's two little islets there, and then you can see that's also the image that's been used in the pamphlet uh, that's used here. Now, if you look in more detail at those islets, which will be in the next slide, we can see that the structure within the islet within a slice is very well preserved. So I want to highlight the green that's showing you laminin staining, which is a basement membrane protein in the system. So it surrounds the islet as a capsule, and it also surrounds each of the individual capillaries that are running through those islets. Now, if we compare this slice preparation to the standard islet, isolated islet preparation, then we can see there's a dramatic difference in this laminin staining. On the left-hand side, you can see the staining. The laminin is very fragmented. That's the isolated islet prep that most people use. But on the right-hand side, you can see the preservation of the structure in the slice, and it really is very dramatic. You can trace all the capillaries within the islet. Now, this is the same image that I showed you before, but now I want you to focus in on the red. Now, the red is a protein uh, called liprin that is present in beta cells, and we know in other cell types that liprin is responsible for the control of secretion. And what you can see when you look at the distribution of red is it very closely aligns to where you've got the capillaries, which were stained in green, as I said earlier on. Now this then entrains the response of the beta cells, and what you're seeing here with the yellow is where I'm identifying, or we're identifying each individual fusion of an insulin granule. And what we can see is that the fusion of those insulin granules is closely aligned to the capillaries here, so along the bottom and also along the top. In addition, we can see upstream when we look at the calcium response that is, res that is responsible for actually making the insulin uh, granules fuse, is that that is also orientated with respect to the capillaries. So here we're looking at response to glucose in a single cell, and you can see the very first calcium response is where the um, beta cells are adjoining the capillaries, and then it spreads as a wave across the cell. Now, overall, when we compare the responses that we're getting in the slice compared to the isolated islet preparation, which is the classic preparation, you can see that across all the doses of glucose, we can see an enhanced response to insulin. And also, when you're looking at the lower concentrations of glucose, you can see a response uh, in uh, insulin secretion in the slices that you can't see in the isolated islets. So this is a cartoon representation of what the picture that we're building up showing you the islet capillary interface. I've shown you that this is a region where we get insulin granule fusion preferentially occurring. And I've also shown you that this is where we get an enhancement of the calcium response. And it's the location of this protein called liprin. Now what we're working on now is to try and understand how all of this apparatus actually gets positioned in the right place at the capillary interface. And we're looking in particular at a protein there called LL5-beta, which is associated with microtubules. And uh, Kali in my lab has shown that it couples to ELKS, which is part of that complex. In addition, we've been looking, we've had a long-standing interest in integrins, which are enriched in this region. This is, they're, they're what's responding to the extracellular matrix. 
And recently we've been working on the protein that's colored in yellow there, which is CANC, which we've shown is linked to the integrins and is also then coupling to this apparatus. So we're beginning to build up quite a complex picture that is showing you what's happening at this interface. Now the take home message isn't that when we're looking at stem cells that we need to reproduce exactly what we're seeing in the islet. But if we can reproduce the way that those uh, cues are being presented to the cell, we can entrain the cell and then enhance the activity and the responses of the beta cells. So it remains for me to thank the two members of the lab who actually did this, which both of whom have been uh, supported by JDRF funding, and that's Dylan and Kylie, and they both had top-up funding for their PhD scholarships, and also the other funding uh, bodies that have funded this research, and thank you for listening. Um, our next speaker is uh, Professor Assam al Oster, um, whose presentation is titled EZH2 Inhibition Influences Pancreatic Progenitor Capacity. Professor Al Oster is an epigeneticist dedicated to understanding health and disease. His team explores the relationship between different classes of co-repressor and activator complexes and the regulation of chromatin remodeling events in maintaining gene expression implicated in disease. Welcome, Professor Al Oster. So thanks for the, uh, the opportunity to present some of our data. I'm a transcriptional biologist with an emphasis on epigenetics and its role in uh, beta cell biology. <laughs> and this is just a picture of uh, how complex our genome is. You may uh, understand some of our work from uh, hyperglycemic memory and, and epigenetic changes as well as DNA methylation and its involvement in uh, diabetic uh, nephropathy. Today I'm going to highlight some work that shows that DNA methylation um, parallels in mouse and human, but that this is not precise. And in fact, uh, there are a separation of DNA methylation that I'm going to highlight, suggest that uh, this is separation in, in the mouse and in human pancreas. We're interested in trying to understand this separation in mouse and human. Uh, global H3K27, which is written by the transcriptional factor EZH2, is almost flipped in the mouse when compared to human studies. And I'm going to show some evidence that suggests that EZH2 is a master regulator of this mechanism. Here we've used a, a small molecule inhibitor, GSK126, re reduces H3K27 in human. Um, in correlates in the mouse, we don't see a reduction in the pancreas, although we do see a reduction in the kidney. Somehow this morphogenetic difference in the mouse and human pancreas, and this is exemplified when we look at uh, non-human primates in the marmoset, we see uh, an increase in indices for PDX and insulin in response to this um, inhibitor GSK126, clearly shown in the non-human primate. And this is just an example of uh, studies that we've performed with St. Vincent's, highlighting that beta cell uh, indices, progenitors, and extracurricular factors are vastly different between non-diabetic and type 1 diabetic donors. Uh, clearly, as expected, insulin, PDX1, NGN, and SOX9, these progenitor markers are not expressed. So using the recording method, uh, classical method of uh, exocrine isolation, we've been able to purify uh, the pancreatic ductal cells and stimulate these cells using uh, small molecule inhibitors. Here we confirm that these uh, inhibitors of EZH2 in do de re reduce K27, does not touch the acetylation mark on the same residue, so it is very specific and there is no major change in other histone modifications. K9 is suspected to be in response to the K27 reduction. Not only do we see this reduction in enzyme activity associated with chromatin, but also gene content. So, uh, IGF-2 and insulin genes are reduced in response to the EZH2 inhibitor, and this uh, allows gene expression. And here we see this uh, when we compare the non-diabetic donors versus 
uh, a child with uh, type 1 diabetes, we see these uh, progenitor and beta cell indices are now starting to become re-expressed, including NGN, uh, PDX1, and insulin in response to the EZH2 inhibitor. So one of the, the questions that we have in the laboratory is how specific this is for uh, pa pancreatic ductal cells. So we've used a number of um, EZH2 inhibitors, GSK126, Tazimitstat, which is FDA-approved, and uh, triptolide. And we've used a, a very simple culture method, uh, exposing these cells and stimulating them with these drugs. We don't see uh, changes in H3K27 acetylation, dramatic changes in the methylation in response to these drugs in human pancreatic ductal cells. We also see uh, an association with gene content. So this re repressive effect is alleviated. We see reductions in insulin, NGN3, and PDX1 in response to these three small molecule inhibitors, not influencing uh, H3K914 acetylation. So this is a very specific mechanism. And we're also very interested in trying to understand whether there's protein expression as well. And here we, we're now starting to see the emergence of insulin by immunofluorescence after two and seven days. Of course, we're also uh, keen to understand whether there's glucose-mediated response, and uh, many of you may be aware that the uh, hyperglycemia influences uh, epigenetic marks. We've also tested this. We don't see major changes in the expression of EZH2 and other chromatin-modifying agents uh, by protein and by mRNA, and the glucose stimulation uh, sensitive insulin secretion assay at two and seven days, we, s we see an uh, increase in the secretion of insulin in response to GSK, uh, EPZ, and tryptolide after two and seven days of stimulation, suggesting that there is a glucose response. So the take home message here is that we're at, um, we're, we're suggesting that pancreatic ductal cells can be influenced to be primed to behave like beta-like cells by reducing EZH2 activity, a master regulator of gene expression, and that EZH2 is primarily writing that specific epigenetic mark. Of course, there are many people to acknowledge, and this is why they're listed. Uh, just a shout out to Keith Al-Hassani. Um, Keith Al-Hassani and and Sophia, and of course this, this work wouldn't be possible without our collaborators and uh, uh, th their generous encouragement by, by Lena and Thomas Ludovaris, Helen Thomas and uh, Thomas Kane, of course JDRF International and the donors, thank you. Thank you very much. You might have a trick up your sleeve now, Anand. You're banned. <laughs> um, so uh, now it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Anand Hardika, um, who's a professor at Western Sydney University and a visiting professor at Steno Diabetes Centre in Copenhagen and the Ross Kilde University in Denmark. He's also the vice president of the Islet Society in Sweden. His research foci include molecular biomarkers of type 1 diabetes progression, islet cell biology and epigenetics. So welcome Anand, who's going to talk about markers of beta cell decline. And that was functional decline. Um, good morning and uh, thanks everyone, thanks for having me. Um, I would like to acknowledge our funding agencies and group members, mainly Mukta and Wilson uh, in this picture, and that's our new labs at Western Sydney University. So, um, the functional decline during progression to type 1 diabetes is characterized by a genetic uh, predisposition, as you can see here, um, the, uh, the trigger event or set of events, and a functional decline in, um, uh, towards progression to clinical onset type 1 diabetes. And I would like to go through each of these um, just to introduce you the rationale of our work. So, uh, genetic risk is something that can be measured at birth, but a high genetic risk score doesn't really mean that uh, these individuals would have diabetes. And an analogy that I can drive, uh, think of is that if you drive on the road, you're at risk of road accidents. And your level of risk depends on the safety rating of your GRS and also on the situation you're in. 
Some scenarios are very different, and the risks in Australia are very different to the risks in some other places where you drive on the wrong side of the road. So basically what I wanted to emphasize is that life is highly dynamic, and GRS offers a very constant or static biomarker um, for prediction of this kind of risk. Um, and therefore, uh, to, to capture more of this ethnicity and environment, um, we need to look at more dynamic markers. So the pros are GRS is once in a lifetime. It's well developed by Exeter Group and analyzed in many several studies, but it provides a constant risk over dynamic lifetimes, and it's difficult to apply across multi-ethnic populations with all the proxies and everything that people have been measuring. So autoantibodies, um, and, and this is um, a bubble plot that I generated using MLSTEM's review, um, a recent review, outlining all the different uh, biomarker screening studies. And you would see that most of these um, are looking at uh, genetic risk goals or autoantibodies, um, uh, with a few of them having a metabolic uh, measurement uh, in them. However, as, um, as you, uh, just to remind you from the Atkinson uh, Eisenbach uh, curve, we are looking at functional uh, decline in beta cell mass as individuals progress to type 1 diabetes. So autoantibodies are dynamic biomarkers. They can be measured with relative ease, and uh, John showed us that yesterday. Um, but um, but uh, it's, it's really important to think of the street light effect that Dorota highlighted in her talk as well, and therefore autoantibodies are there already at the beginning of T1D. So what about glu uh, glucose? Because, uh, and, and this brings me to just remind you to what Jenny showed us briefly uh, through a study that was recently um, published by the GPAD point investigators in GCI Insight. And what these investigators did was they measured glucose in over 1,000 individuals and showed that individuals who progress uh, to autoantibody positivity had a relatively higher fasting um, and lower 30-minute glucose in the autoantibody progresses compared to the non-progresses. And so, um, Functional uh, measurements are really important before seroconversion. Now, thinking of all this, uh, we, can, we can say that, uh, uh, just as a summary, um, progression is a dynamic process. Um, GRS cannot provide the dynamism. Autoantibodies can, but it's a street life effect. Um, what's a better marker of beta cell function? And at this point, I would just like to uh, remind you of my interest in the field is in microRNAs, which are small non-coding RNAs. And they have, we and others have shown, that microRNAs are not only essential for beta cell and pancreas development, but also for insulin transcription, which is very central to um, beta cell function. And so the question is, can microRNAs be a surrogate for beta cell function? And these are studies that are put together in another bubble plot. Uh, most of them are candidate microRNAs, but this is a study with the red arrows showing the discovery and validation that we carried out across um, four different continents with the support of JDRF Australia uh, in over 2,200 individuals. And the microRNA risk go we get um, can, can fairly accurately uh, stratify individuals with uh, stage three or four type one diabetes. I mean, our data are uh, from multi-ethnic cohorts, but what's also interesting through these studies is we found that the microRNA risk scores can also enhance uh, other biomarkers which are not really good, such as uh, insulin cell-free DNA uh, with a very low predictive power can be enhanced, and even autoantibodies can be enhanced uh, by adding the microRNA risk score on top of the autoantibody. So what we have show, uh, generated till now is through this kind of study, um, which I presented, but we do have some other longitudinal data coming from um, Christina Rother or with Steve Gittleman and our uh, ILEC transplant collaborators, Kirsty and James, um, 
Uh, and, and now what we are trying to do is, with the support from JDR and NHMRC, uh, with Jenny Cooper, uh, David Simmons and others, we are looking at uh, newborn samples or heel prick samples um, and developing microRNA risk scores for progression to autoimmunity. So um, in summary, what I tried to show is that microRNAs capture a dynamic uh, change in t one d risk. Uh, a T th uh, stage three, stage four MRS has been developed. Um, we are developing an MRS for stage one and two, and a six minute, 40 second Pecha Kucha format is not really the best <laughs> to provide information over 10 years, so really appreciate if you want to come back. So thank you again for our key investigators, and uh, um, I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Anand. So our last presenter for this uh, morning's session is Professor Toby Coates. Uh, Professor Toby Coates, AO, is a clinician scientist at the Royal Adelaide Hospital and renal transplant nephrologist, as well as a clinical professor in medicine at the University of Adelaide. He's the director of kidney and pancreas islet transplantation at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. So thank you very much, Professor Coates, who's going to talk to us about CAR-T regs as a therapy for autoimmune-driven type 1 diabetes. Thank you. And I'm presenting this on behalf of my PhD student, uh, Jackie Scafardi, who almost certainly would have been able to cope with the previous format. I cannot, and therefore this was a traditional presentation in the next six minutes. So CAR-T regs are... Uh, something which hasn't really been raised in this conference uh, so far, but a very hot and topical area in, in uh, immunology. And this is a very nice collaboration between Simon Barry's lab uh, and between our lab, uh, both of whom have been supported by JDR for many years, but this particular project uh, is not. So we do know that um, defects in regulatory T cells very much underlie the pathogenesis of, of type 1 diabetes. And we know that if you deplete Tregs or you reduce FOXP3 expression, which is the critical uh, transcription factor that maintains Treg function, you can get rapid onset of diabetes in the nod mice, particularly if they're containing uh, antigens. Uh, the CD4 cells express the TCR specific for pancreatic uh, uh, antigens. The very rare disease IPEX, which is uh, characterized by deletion of the FOXP3 in humans, produces very aggressive uh, autoimmune diabetes, including type 1. And we also know that the, uh, the type 1 diabetic patients have got an altered phenotype of their Tregs and also the uh, ability to, inability to suppress conventional cells, which is what drives the diabetic process. And when we look at uh, type 1 patients and we pull out their Tregs, we find that they've got uh, lower levels of FOXP3 uh, and also have uh, changes in their interleukin-2 signaling pathway, all of which point to the fact that uh, FOXP3 and Tregs may be something that would be useful to be able to, useful to, be able to target. So we hypothesized that we could express one of these chimeric antigen receptors on Tregs, which might potentially induce a much broader but localized immunosuppressive uh, capacity on the T conventional cells, which potentially may help us um, by bystander immunosuppression defeat the autoimmune process which destroys the pancreas. So just very quickly, the, the CAR T reg cell looks like this. The advantage of it uh, is it can be tailored really to any antigen. It's not restricted to MHC, which is also very, very helpful. And you can modify the signaling domains. And as I indicated before, if we've got a problem with interleukin-2 secretion, then potentially modifying the signaling domains in our modified cells may be another way of enhancing their function. So really, you can see the conventional um, way that we think about things on the right-hand side. Whoops, go back. Uh, over there on the right, the conventional APC T cell receptor uh, interaction. The CAR T cell, on the other hand, with this targeted antibody that sits on the surface there um, and the ability to modify the domains intracellularly uh, is a completely novel way of, of targeting, targeting uh, pathogenesis. And is something, of course, that's uh, taken off in the, in the cancer area and something that is of interest, I think, in type 1 area. So um, what uh, Jackie's done uh, has been uh, target GAD65. We've been following Stuart Mannering's work for years, so we thought this would be a very useful target. And as you've heard yesterday in this presentations, 70 to 80% of patients will have antibodies to, uh, to GAD, so it seems to us to be a very logical target. But importantly, with these chimeric antigen receptors, you can change that for whatever particular target you want. So this is just, if you like, a prototype version of what we might do, potentially for different stages uh, in autoimmunity. And we know that GAD's expressed uh, in the beta cell. We know it's a target, uh, but it's also expressed uh, in the central nervous system, both in mice and humans. So that's potentially an off-target effect, 
but effect, effectively with the uh, blood-brain barrier in place, that should minimise that, and we think it would be a reasonable thing to, to proceed to do. So you can just see the structure that we've done there. And we've optimised the uh, intracellular domain by adding a STAT5 uh, signalling component to this so that we hope that uh, we'll stabilise the interleukin-2 secretion uh, underneath it. So just briefly, um, the data that, um, that I want to show you today. Um, firstly, uh, car expression, we were able to do this, generate this um, in human naive Treg cells. You can see down the bottom in figure B there, um, a nice expression, EGFR receptor uh, expression that shows that we get very high transcription when we do this. And secondly, when we look for suppression, we create these cells from naive T cells and then look at suppression. You can see nice uh, suppression at different uh, concentrations down to one in, one in 16 dilution. And that's with uh, either the CAR-T that's been modified with STAT5, uh, which is the blue bar, or potentially all of the controls that you can see along there. Critically, when you look at the phenotype, which I'm showing you in, in, in figure B there, you can see they're expressing CTLA-4, so our manipulation doesn't affect uh, their... Uh, they're critical Fox, uh, they're critical Treg markers. Uh, they're maintaining CD25, FOXP3, and Helios. So they've got all the things that we need to do. And the most important piece of information that you see down the bottom in Figure C is uh, suppression or proliferation, I should say, in response to the GAD antigen. You can see on the left hand side there nice proliferation, no proliferation with BSA, and then the positive control on the other side. So uh, what we've done, or what she's done in her PhD now, is to having done all that uh, in vitro work, we're now up to the point of, of uh, working or moving across to people. And I thought this was a nice slide. This is one of, a, uh, one of our volunteers, so healthy type 1 diabetic uh, donors. We've had five of them come in to have a leukapheresis, uh, which is a procedure where we separate the white blood cells from the red cells. It gives us a very large number of cells, as you can see on that side, which we can separate into the T regs that we can modify, but importantly also the T conventional cells. So we can do the in vitro experiments now to show that the cells that we modify will suppress uh, in vitro and then ultimately we'll go on hopefully to do some animal work um, and prove proof of, proof of concept. So at the moment we've got, uh, we've been able to generate uh, patient specific uh, CAR T reg cells and they do look like they can suppress GAD specific T cell responses. Um, we could see this as potentially being an autologous therapy, that is a, a CAR T reg cell to suppress the individual's specific T cell immunity for the antigen that they've got using their own cells. And we're very comfortable with that sort of process because we do a lot of islet auto transplantation, so we're comfortable with doing that sort of thing. So this could be an early prevention or, uh, or treatment of autoimmunity. And of course, from my point of view, as a transplant, uh, treatment of uh, recurrent autoimmunity uh, after islet or, or pancreas transplantation. Thank you. <laughs>